Hi, everyone. I'm here tonight to teach on sexual sins and soul ties. <laughs> We're good? All right, that's fine. So this, this subject is really important because well, any subject that we're teaching on about freedom is very important, but especially with sexual sin, because when you look at what's happening in the world right now, you know that the enemy has a, a plan to take America out. Just how they're having, you know, with, with um, just even the gay marriage that was uh, instituted, and then also now this transgender law that they're trying to implement, trying in the school system, teach kids the LGBT uh, curriculum, et cetera. Listen, God loves everybody, but what God hates is sin, right? And, um, you know, and, and there's been so much casual sin and casual, uh, a casual lifestyle that, that seems to be okay. Someone, you know, they had that Tinder app, right? Where people would just get together and hook up and just get together and have sex. We've ministered to people that just hooked up, right? And so it might seem like it's just fun. It might seem like it's, oh, what's the big deal? It's fun for a season. You know, Kamalia Harris, what she say? Just two consenting adults. But you don't understand the spiritual implication behind that and the hurt and the wounds. And, and when we get into the soul ties, and, you'll, you know, we'll do an illustration tonight, um, it's really, really important that we understand how, you know, God's order and why he wants us to live a life of purity. And um, he doesn't say no to sin, to sexual sin, because he wants anyone to suffer. There's, it's no, he says no to sin because he wants us to align with his promises that gives us an abundant life. Um, so I was reading an article. I didn't read the book about this man. His, his name is Edward Gibbons, and he wrote a book called um, The Fall of the Roman Empire. And um, no, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's called The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. And, um, and he says, this is what he said. Now, whether it's fact, I don't know. He wrote this in his book. I did look up other references, and, and, and uh, the ones who contest that are, were not born again. But he says, proven hysterical fact that caused the fall of Rome was that they gave themselves over to sexual immorality. He said, in fact, it led to the downfall of Egypt, Greece, and Babylon. So immorality is a sin against society. L let's start out in Genesis 19 with Sodom and Gomorrah, right? It wasn't just sexual sin. It was sexual sin, but also their arrogance and their haughtiness and, and their disobedience to the Lord. And um, I, Abraham was an intercessor praying for um, over uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and praying for his nephew Lot, praying for their freedom. And so... That says a lot to me because our prayers and understanding, first, first of all, the severity of sexual immorality, but also understanding the power of our intercession and how it does make a difference for people that we know that are in the lifestyle. Uh, you know, and even, listen, people in the church, we, we minister to a lot of people in the church that are all having sex. Or they may be doing certain things that they, they don't, you know, it's like Bill Clinton thing. You know, we didn't have sex, but they're doing everything else. I'm sorry, it's sex. So um, this is something this guy, Edward Gibbons, quoted. He said, immorality causes us to sin against society. People who treat sex lightly treat other human beings, other human beings lightly. It's true, right? And then he said, immorality is the enemy of the home, and the enemy of the home is the enemy of this nation. And so the enemy is always after. I mean, just even, uh, listen, we love black lives, but we don't support Black Lives Matter. And it's a Marxist group. And they um, actually, in their mission statement, said that their goal is to destroy the family. Okay? That's serious. And God instituted the family. Now, God loves everybody in Black Lives Matter. He wants them saved, too. We need to pray for them. But I have to speak the truth of what we need to address here. Um, okay. So, let me just turn my volume off. Um, so there's a sexual revolution. It's nothing that we don't know. And it's wreaking havoc in our lives. Promiscuity, nudity, sexual obscenities have become commonplace. You turn TV on, it's like nothing. 
people are just living together. People are doing their own thing. People, are, how many that people that we have to deal with that are um, battling with porn, and um, you know, it's it's a serious addiction for those that are trying to get set free. It, it really is a serious issue for men and women. You know, um, there was a statement that I know when I was younger. You know, I don't know if it was a song. I don't know who said it, but it said if you know they would say if it feels good, do it. Well, that's pretty much what everyone's doing, but after the aftermath of that is what causes so much pain and heartache. And when, you know, we'll, I know a lot of you know about soul ties, but we're going to, we'll just teach a little bit on that again. But it causes such devastation in your life when there's sexual sin. That's why it's such heartache when um, people break up, especially in a marriage. There's such divorce because it's, it's a splitting, it's a separation, it's a tearing apart, and, it, and it's a devastating thing. So, um, you know, uh, the enemy loves us to, to be in sin. He loves us to disobey the word because many people will say, I, well, I need to, you know, um, I have needs, right? Well, the enemy knows you have needs, but God knows you have needs. In 1 Corinthians 10, or I think 13, it says that he provides a way of escape for every temptation that we have, right? And so, but when, when we obey Satan and do what he wants, in essence, you are worshiping him. When we obey God, we worship him. See, it's that simple. And so, we, you know, I want to be honorable to the Lord. Listen, to, listen. the Lord's not a prude. He's the one who designed sex. He's the one who created it, right? And he, he, he created it for a husband's, husband and wife's pleasure, and, but not to step out of his umbrella of protection, not to, you know, come out of the, his pathway or his alignment because he's, he knows it's for a reason. And when you open yourself up, and having, you know, in fornication, adultery, any type of sexual sin, that's how you open yourself up to a spirit. And just like in any type of sin, you open yourself up to a, sin, a, a spirit. But, you know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, and I have it on your handout, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so it's a, it's a sin against our body. And, and we are his temple, and we are to honor and, 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 and you know, love on the Lord and, and be pure and holy and not have lust and perverted thoughts, right? So ungodly sexual relationship is contrary to God's order, and it's a form of worship that gives the enemy to assault us, the spiritual ties. And um, godly sexual relationship was designed for marriage, for between a husband and a wife to be monogamous. So... We have to really get this down. And, and again, you're all here because you, you want to be here and you know it. But I'm praying that many people watch this. And there's, there really is a lot online. I was listening to a testimony by, you all know Kay Arthur, yeah. right? Amazing woman of God. Well, she, she, had, she was an immoral woman. And she gives her testimony about her lifestyle and, and how uh, she really basically had a sexual addiction. And... Um, she said that it was just awful, and, and she would have affairs with married men. And, uh, like, she knew it was wrong, but, but she just couldn't stop until one day her son actually caught her, a younger boy caught her in the act with somebody. How, I mean, devastating is that, right? And she just cried out to the Lord and said, I, I don't want to live this way anymore. And that's the beauty of whatever anyone's going through, especially with sexual addiction. It, it, with any kind of addiction, you call out to God, you cry out to the Lord, he will come and set you free. And, that, uh, and that's what she did. And she said she, she knew of Jesus, but she never had a deep, intimate relationship with him. And that when she cried out, she said that was a turning point in her life because she was sick of it. She was done. She was devastated that her young boy and she, she shares this in her testimony, so I'm not saying anything private. She, her, her young son caught her in the act. How awful, right? And she said, that was it. That, she said, I'll do anything. She says, God, I just want freedom. And now look at what God has done in her life, right? And um, so anyway, so, you know, that's the thing with any kind of sin. God's heart, God's heart is for us. He wants people to get set free. But the person has to absolutely want freedom in their lives. The Bible has so much to talk about, so much to say about sexual sin in the Bible. I, I, I was just amazed. I mean, I knew there was a lot in there, but my goodness. 
I, if I gave you all the scriptures, you would have had like 20 pages of notes. <laughs> so I cut back on them. And I promise I won't read them all. But in Jude 1.7 in the Passion, I believe this is on your handout, it says, In a similar way, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and nearby towns gave themselves to sexual immorality and the unnatural desire of different flesh. Now they all serve as examples of those who experience the punishment of eternal fire. See, again, the Bible you know, says that the wages of sin is death, but sexual sin, and, and, and in addition to others, and we'll get through those scriptures, causes you to, to live in eternal fire. I mean, you'd never get satisfied. There's always, a, that's why it's called lust, lust of the flesh, that you're always lusting after something. You're always wanting more. It's never enough. You know, we were just uh, uh, talking about, a, a friend of mine was talking about someone who, a uh, well-known person, and that's when they were doing that thing where they would, um, you know, strangle themselves where they would get that sexual high. And, and this young man died. He was only 20 years old. And he had, because uh, she was a nurse and she was working with him, uh, working in a trauma area. And um, he had brain damage and then he just died after a couple of years. See, the, 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 the depravity of how the enemy sets people up. We have dealt with people in conferences, ministering to them um, that were involved in all kinds of pornography, bestiality, all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and you hear what people have exposed themselves to, and you, you know, you're listening to that, and your heart breaks. Because no one, I'm sorry, nobody wants to get to that place. Who wants to be involved in that? And they would come up and, you know, we, we, it was uh, Peter Wagner would host these conferences uh, for sexual sin. And I forget what the name of the conference was, but and we would have to minister to these people. And um, so we had different speakers, and afterwards people would come up and share what they've gone through. And uh, my Lord, some of the stuff, and uh, I mean, bestiality was on the top five, let me just say that. And so, you know, you, you just don't think of any of that. But then you think, man, what happened to these people? How did it get to that place of perversion that you go that low, right? But the good news is Jesus came to set the captives free and that whatever you're battling, any kind of addiction, especially in any kind of sexual addiction, Jesus came to set you free. So in Romans 6.23, it says that the wages of sin is death, right? And so, um, you know, the payback is really heartache, devastation, uh, when, when we're ministering to couples that have broken up or, or people that were just living together and just doing their thing, the heartache is devastating for a lot of them. And, um, and it's very, very painful, right? So in Proverbs twenty eight thirteen says, In the passion, if you cover up your sin, you'll never do well. But if you confess your sins and forsake them, you'll be kissed by mercy. And that's what I, I always love that because God wants us to expose, not hide. The enemy likes us to hide. That's what cult, cultism is, really. It hides, right? And the enemy wants us to hide, and the Lord wants us to confess our sins or confess our faults one to another, that we will be healed. And so if you're, you know, if a person's battling, it's good to get help. It's good to say, hey, I need some help. Hey, could you help me in this area? Because I'm really struggling. You see, the enemy wants to put shame on people, and God's saying, no, no, I want to set you free from that shame, and I want to help you in that area so that your life is turned around, and there's restoration and reconciliation, and, um, and we have seen that happen in a person's life. So uh, one of the things, uh, if you think about it, sexual sin begins in the mind. People start fantasizing, right? And, and that's where if you nip it in the bud and you, you meditate on the word. What is the saying in Philippians? Whatsoever is pure. Think on whatsoever is pure and good and lovely of good report. Think on these things, not fantasizing, not thinking about, you know, crazy stuff. That's why you have to watch what you're watching on TV or movies. Right. Right. The, everything has sex in it. There's no need for that. I don't need to watch someone having sex. <laughs> you're trying to watch a really good movie and then boom there it is and like here we go we're like where's the remote you're trying to fast forward it you know I don't want to you can't unsee something you've seen and the enemy knows this and so you know but everything it's like oh man if it feels good just go for it I mean, you know they're, they're just religious fanatics no 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 because we get the people and we counsel everybody that's going through this of the heartache and the heartbreak and the devastation that happens it's fun for a season but then afterwards, it's not so much fun. 
And then you have people then getting pregnant, then having abortions, not knowing what to do with that. Then there's a whole cycle that, that, that gets going. And so, no, it's not fun. And then what about when there's betrayal in a relationship, sexual betrayal? What about when there's in, in a marriage and there's infidelity? It's devastating. 2 Corinthians 6.16 in, in the Passion says, What friendship does God's uh, temple, we are the temple, have with demons? For indeed we are the temple of the living God, just as God has said. I will make my home in them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. See, we are his temple. The spirit of the living God is living within us. Right? Just like, you know, you don't want to do anything that's going to insult him. You don't want to watch anything that offends him. You want to be careful. And um, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 says, Surely you must know that people who practice evil cannot possess God's kingdom realm. Stop being deceived. People who continue to engage in sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, sexual perversion, homosexuality, fraud, greed, drunkenness, verbal abuse, or extortion will not inherit God's kingdom realm. Okay? Now... That doesn't mean we are judgmental. That doesn't mean we, we mistreat people or, or have a self-righteous attitude towards people. Because that can be any one of us. And if that's not ours, we can be gossiping. We can be having a bitter heart, angry, nasty. So, you know, none of us walk on water here. And so, but this is something that I take very seriously when I read that. So if God has a scripture like that in the word of God, then that means there's an alternative. That means there's an antidote. That means he came to set the captives free, and the person doesn't have to stay in that mess. The lie is there's no hope for you. The lie is homosexuals, you gotta, you're stuck. Well, we've ministered to many homosexuals and lesbians, and they've been delivered and set free. I've been on the board with one who is a male prostitute who... He said, and he shares this in his testament, he's been with over a 1,000 men. He's been set free. He has a ministry called Pure Life or Pure Passion, I think. Uh, it's David Kyle Foster. And, and amazing testimonies of people's lives who have been radically transformed, who were steeped in the, in the lifestyle. Nothing is impossible with the Lord. Um. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, this is why you must keep running away from sexual immorality. Run. Joseph ran. In the Bible, in Genesis, he knew to run from Potiphar's wife. Now you say, yeah, but he still went to prison. Yeah, but God had a plan and got him out. But he became governor, but he ran from that, that snake, from that, that spirit that would try to take him out. He said, this is why, and I'm going to read it again, this is why you must keep running away from sexual immorality. For every other sin a person commits is, is external to the body, but immorality involves sinning against your own body, right? 1 Corinthians 3.17 in the New Living says, God will destroy anyone who destroys his temple, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So think about Samson. In the Bible, right? Look at him with Delilah. I think sexual sin makes you stupid. Because think about this. How many times is Delilah trying to get him to give him the secret? And then every time, I would have said the first time, like, why do you keep asking me that? Then the second time, you're out, right? How many times? And then she finally tells him the secret. That's stupid. But the, you, you, get, you get so caught up in that, that lustful lie, and, and you, you lose your marbles. You're not smart. And you don't think people who are involved in immorality that are in adulterous relationships, you don't think. Hey, Arthur was saying she was on the floor in her living room. Her kids were upstairs. You're not thinking. But that was a turning point for her. That was what turned her around. Or she was, like, horrified that her son caught her. But, but that was a turning point. So regardless of where you're at, the Lord can use that, turn that thing around for you and bring it into a free life where you're not bound by lust and perversion and, and that need to always, you know, get over over there. And so look at David. David committed sexual sin, right? He did not address the sin in his family. When you study David's life, now he was, now here's the cool thing. David was a man after God's own heart. And the Lord loved him dearly because he had a, I believe that with David, he just had a heart after the Lord and he would sincerely repent. There was godly sorrow there, but there are consequences to a lifestyle. 
See, people say, well, I'll just repent. We counsel the couple. And the guy said to the girl, you know, sometimes you want to get the spirit of smack one to rise up, you know, some of these people, men, some of them. And <laughs> some of them, some of them. And the guy told the girl, hey, listen, we love each other. We're good. We we'll just, after we're done, we we'll just get up and repent. And that's the Lord for forgiveness. I said, God is not mocked, you know. And so I looked at the girl like, you need to get rid of this guy. And uh, no commitment, no honor. My father always said, the man loves you, he'll honor you, he'll marry you. And so um, anyway, so David committed sexual sin. His whole family, they were destroyed. His son Amnon killed um, one of the brothers, I forget uh, his name. He killed him because he raped his sister Diana. Then Absalom Oh, Absalom killed him. Okay, Absalom killed Amnon, and then Absalom tried to take over his father's throne. There was a lot of sin in the family line. We have to address our sins in our family and stop blaming everybody and their mother for what we're doing. It's like, okay, here's the deal. Here's my all and my part. And then we repent. That's generational sins, what we were talking about, about the sins of what our family, you know, what, what they were involved in. But we have free choice. Right? So David committed sexual sin and his family was messed up. But, but God, anyone who cried out to the Lord would, is, is redeemed. All right? So I always want to bring that, that point out to you. Um, so let's see here. In, six, in Matthew 6.21, it says, Wherever your tra- treasure is, there your desires of your heart will be. So we have the capacity to worship but, I mean, like, let's look at, like, when you think of that guy, Mr. Weinstein. What's his first name, Peter? Harvey. Harvey. All right. He, he didn't start out that way. Right? But look at the mess. Look at how he wound up. Right. And look at what happened in his life. Look at all the people that were hurt as a result of that, that lifestyle. And then the other guy, Epstein, who they say is still alive. I don't know. But, um, but you know, look at his life. Look at what happened to the poor girls and boys that were raped and sex trafficked. Look at all that. Look at the government. I better watch because I might get turned off here. But anyway, so, you know, we have to watch and, and, you know, and and be careful about what's happening, but not allow the world's influence to overtake us. We have to be the light. But see, where Christians can blow it is where we get this stinking self-righteous attitude where we look down upon a person, think about... You don't just become a sexual predator. Something had to happen. Now, again, I get, I get there's a line drawn in the sand, but like as aggravated as I was when I was hearing about Harvey Weinstein, I, I said, Lord, what happened to this man? That, that he would do that and act so crude and, you know, money, there was power involved and so forth and so on. But, I mean, he has to pay. Look at the consequence of his sin, right? So... God, would God forgive him? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, I, I pray that God always forgives me. And the Bible says that, you know, he's rich in mercy. And so anyway, so, um, but see, the thing is, so it's like we have to get back to loving the Lord with all our heart. In Deuteronomy 6, 5, it says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your, all your soul, and all your strength. There's idolatry. There's counterfeit affection. So when you're involved in sexual sin, and again, this could be anything, but when you're involved in sexual sin, there's a counterfeit affection. You're looking for instant gratification. You're looking for love in all the wrong places, right? And so it's that instant gratification, but then there's that need. It's not fulfilled. It's good for a little bit. It's good for a little bit. Then it's not fulfilled, and then you try to get more, and then, you know, you have multiple partners. I, I had to deal with one woman. And, you know, she also was abused in her family life. And we were talking about soul ties, which we'll get into in a minute. And I said to her, I'm not laughing, but I said, well, I said, let's just go through. We'll break some soul ties. She goes, honey, we'll be here all night. She goes, I had over 100 men. I'm like, oh, okay. So I said, well, we'll do a group prayer, you know. But uh, (laughs) I said, we will deal with this thing, you know. But, you know, listen, (laughs) she was, I mean, we were every kid around. But, I mean, the devastation in people's lives. You don't just want 100 men just because, hey, you know, I'm just bored. I just want to get involved with all these men. She was raped as a child. There was heartache and abuse in her life, you know. And, and, and she was willing to be honest to talk about what went down. It was totally confidential. It was never repeated. And, and um, you know, this is 30 years ago. You know, and, and, but she got freedom. 
And but she was hungry for freedom. And that's the thing. We need to be hungry. And no matter what you're dealing with, hunger is the ingredient that we all need. It's the hunger and thirst after righteousness. And, and the spirit of the Lord will meet us wherever we're at. And he wants to destroy that self-destructive cycle that, that, that this lifestyle causes. And so we want to uh, break out of that vicious cycle even of shame and guilt and blame shifting. And when people are involved in a lot of that, they're ashamed to come out and share what's going on, right? But the Lord wants people to know, and the churches have to, we have to talk more and more and more about sexual sin and pornography and, you know, different things. Uh, listen, Kay Arthur, the one guy that she was involved with and committed adultery with was a pastor. Listen, pastors are human too. And so sometimes it's like, you know, leaders, have, you know, people think they live on this pedestal that, that nothing ever goes wrong in their life. I wish that were true, but it's not. We have to align and apply ourselves the same way and be accountable. That's why you need to have accountability and, and you know, allow people to speak into your life and call you on things. Because, listen, none of us are perfect here. And so you want to have a transparent light. Peter, did you want to come up and say anything here? Because then I'm going to teach a little bit on soul ties. Yeah, it's good to hear from both sides, right? Men and women. This thing's a little unsafe. Anyway. Yeah, thanks. I just found um, thinking about this um, sort of like rules of engagement. If you're in a battle, um, there's certain ways that you have to figure out the enemy's tactics. And when you, when you can understand the way his strategy works and then compare that to what God's protection is for us, for me at least, it made it easier to, uh, what's the right word? Uh, to rule my spirit. Let's just call it that. Rule your spirit. Rule your appetites. Uh, in the Old Testament, in Proverbs, it says, if you don't rule your spirit, you're like a city with the walls broken down. So one of the rules of engagement, if, if it's a high school kid and he wants to have sex with a girl, he'll try to get her drunk. Why? Because she's not ruling her spirit at that point. Her protection is down. Her walls are down. There's no friends around. So you, know, you could argue, shame on her for allowing that to happen, but thinking that that this that the possibility isn't there for that to happen makes us naive but we also don't want to live always suspecting everybody to do something wrong but wise as a serpent gentle as a dove and what we've seen in in the counseling area is uh, i think i could say this really with no strings attached nothing messes us up more than sexual abuse when it comes to the wiring on the inside of us. And that's a scary statement given it's 2021 and they're trying to pass laws and curriculum that's gonna make the likelihood of that happening much higher, right? So if ever there was an attack against family values and traditional marriage, definition of marriage, biological difference between a boy and a girl, um, it, it would be like the perfect storm from hell to get them to teach kids at the youngest age possible that you can choose whatever you want. And that's what's happening right right around us now. So what is it about that, biblically, that makes it so difficult that our wiring gets so crossed is because of the sanctity of the act of marriage because we create life, and that life is created in the image of God. So we can do something that Satan can't do. We can create an image of God. And all he can do is try to destroy that image. So it's sacred. Marriage is sacred to the Lord. Two become one. And really, like, that's one of the rules of engagement as well. Why would he do that? Well, look, if anybody here has ever been through a divorce um, or, or if you've been on the wrong end of a breakup in a relationship and you didn't want to break up, um, I'm, I'm, when I was in high school, there was uh, Diana Ross and the Supremes was a really uh, popular group. That's how old I am. And uh, there was this real dramatic opening of the song, and, and then she's like, basically was wailing, set me free, why don't you, babe? Get out of my life, why don't you? But you keep me. Remember that one? 
that's like a haunting thing going on. Free me, free me, but I hope you take me back, but free me, free me. See, there's this horrible uh, middle ground that you're, you're not free, but you're still hanging on, but you're not with the person. It's tormenting. So what do we do? We medicate the pain with another relationship. Wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's what we do, but it's, it's just continuing to pile on, right? So one of the verses that helped me before I became a Christian, my mother convinced me to read the Bible, and I got so annoyed with her, I tried to read it just to prove her wrong. And, you know, God loves when somebody does that because the word is so powerful. And she said, just read a couple verses before you go to sleep at night. And I would do that, and then the next day something would happen that would reflect back almost exactly what I had read the night before. Something would happen in my life. And then one night I was sitting there reading Galatians 5, and in verse 16 it says, "Here's I'm going to read it from the voice translation. It says, here's my instruction. Walk in the Spirit and let the Spirit bring order to your life. All right? Can we just all say that right now? Can you say that prayer out loud? Holy Spirit, make yourself real to me. And bring order wherever there's chaos. Give me wisdom to think like heaven, not like the earth. That's fair, right? That's a good prayer. That's something you could say every day. I don't want to eat the food of Babylon. <laughs> Remember what Daniel said? You don't have to give me your food. Give me this, and you'll see. Check me back in a couple of, couple of weeks. See who's doing better. And if we're not doing better, then we'll eat your food. But that's what we do in the culture. We, we eat the things of the world and then expect the fruit of the Spirit. That's not how it works, right? So then he, he goes on in, I, I guess, I read, um, si I'll, I'll read 16. I don't know if I read it. Here's my instruction. Walk in the Spirit and let the Spirit bring order to your life. If you do, you'll never give in to your selfish and sinful cravings. Wow. That's pretty powerful. I'll never give in to my selfish cravings. And then 17 is when the light bulb went on before I was saved. For everything the flesh desires goes against the spirit, and everything the spirit desires goes against the flesh, there's a constant battle raging between them that prevents you from doing the good that you want to do. And then that might sound really obvious now, but I didn't understand spiritual warfare. I, I was trying to gain credit with my friends. And the way you gain credit as a man was to sleep with the most women and the most beautiful women that you could find. You didn't really care that much about them. You cared about the status that you have with the other people. I know this sounds horrible. It's horrible even just to say it. But when you walked into the room, you, it wasn't about her. It was about what everybody else thought about her and, and the status you had for having her on your arm. That's the most shallow, horrendous, bankrupt way of thinking. Uh, but that's what the culture did to us then. I don't, I'm sure there's plenty of similar things that are going on now. And I really repented to the Lord for, for falling into that trap and, and for believing the wrong, that, that that lifestyle would ever make me happy. But I didn't know God, so that was what the world was teaching me. And if you don't have an alternative, you, you buy into whatever the group is that you're involved with, right? So um, I, I, don't, I just want to hit on one other thing because Trisha already – she already touched on 1 Corinthians 6, but could you, if you have your Bible, just go there real quick. I don't know if what I'm about to read a little bit further in there is on there. She read 9 and 10 about people that have these obvious sins, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. None of those will inherit the kingdom of God. But then 11 is for me and maybe somebody else that's watching. It's, all right, he goes through this long list. Uh, don't be deceived in verse 9. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. <laughs> Raise my hand. And such were some of you. And then there's this wonderful word that comes next. But. <laughs> what? But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You really have to understand that idea of sanctification and justification as you come into the kingdom. Yes, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. But there is a process of sanctification, of cleansing the, the pump of all the old wrong ways of thinking. Why else will we be told to renew our minds? That's to believers because there's still old patterns of thinking. And when you're involved with people who love you and know the word, they'll be able to help you rightly divide the word and know how to apply it to your life. 
um, you know, I was just talking to a men's group the other day, and uh, I mean, actually, it was there was a call Wednesday morning. Uh, yeah, this morning, I was on vacation, so I forgot what day it was, and I, I kind of liked that. And it was actually this morning. It was a mixed group, and there, some of the women that were on the call, they're all Wall Street people, you know, successful uh, in business, and they were complaining about how you know how mistreated a lot of the women felt that they were mistreated. But then one of them said, yeah, but then when I read the Bible, it says that wives have to submit to their husbands, and it, and it feels like this really dominating, under you know, the way, if you just read it on the surface, it doesn't look good. And I said, well, read a little further, you know, in Ephesians 5, it says, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives the way Christ loved the church, <laughs> which is harder. It's really easy for a wife to submit to her husband if he's loving her the way Christ loved the church, okay? So there's definitely going to be two sides to it. It's never been meant to be a club to demand. It's what, what we want in a relationship is to feel safe, that we trust, or we trust our partner, and that's why you should hold out for commitment and covenant that that person's willing to say, for better or worse, I'm not leaving, and that they love you enough so that when you make that commitment and life happens to unfold, it's not going to all be pretty. There's going to be tough things that happen. And you have to know that that person is committed to you. And sorry, ladies, but if you just keep giving it away for free with no commitment and then be angry that the guy doesn't want to make a commitment, like, this isn't too hard to figure out. So, like, just be careful that you don't buy into the world's culture again and eat that diet because... You might get the short-term thing that you want is to get a commit from, commitment from somebody, but unless they're grounded in the word, there's no staying power. There's no, no reason for them to want to stay. I remember being uh, newly married, and Trisha and I knew a couple, and uh, the guy would come home every night, and it didn't matter if she did 15 things right, he'd find the 16th thing that was wrong, and he'd be, he'd be upset, you know, that the food wasn't hot enough, or the, curtain, the curtains were, were crooked on the wall, or like some really ridiculous standard that he had, and he, he wasn't perfect either, but that happens a lot up here, I mean, that, that women just feel this threat that if they gain five pounds, their husband's going to leave them. Think about a bankruptcy of, of that. What kind of relationship would that be? There's no strength of, of commitment to that. And, you know, if you're constantly living under the stress of this impossible standard that you have to live up to, you're in bondage to that thing. So, you know, God is asking us to see relationships as sacred, and that's why that particular act is meant for marriage only. And we all win when that happens. The whole culture wins. So that's why if it's bad now and kids are going to be taught in school at five years old that they can be whatever they want, what's that going to mean 20 years from now? If fatherlessness is bad now, what's that going to mean later? You can't even define what a father is. But, I, but we can. <laughs> and I say that the truth is going to stand out much greater in the midst of, of the corruption of the culture because people want truth. People want security. Nobody wants to fragment, and I don't know, you touched on the fragmentation, but I want to give you a verse for that too, which is right there in that same uh, chapter in 1 Corinthians uh, 6. Um, I, I'll, I'll go to verse 13 now, and it says, Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? So this is if a man uh, hires a prostitute, which they would say is the oldest, uh, oldest business in the world, right? I was reading one of our politicians who was uh, attorney general, uh, and they were considering making prostitution legal in her state. It had already passed in, Las, in uh, Nevada, so Las Vegas has legalized prostitution. And she was rightly, like you, she would argue, logically saying, well, if we pass that law in our state, then the sex workers should have rights to be safe and protected. Well, nobody ever called them sex workers when I was growing up. They were called prostitutes, right? And it was the oldest I industry in the world. And she, she said, as long as there's two consenting adults, nobody gets harmed. So think about that. What a lack of spiritual understanding that means. A married man goes and hires a prostitute. He's got a wife and three kids at home. Nobody got harmed? 
when he walks back in the door, he's not walking back in by himself. He's walking in with her, the prostitute. But it gets worse than that. All the guys that had sex with her are coming in with you too. And any of the junk that they were carrying is coming in with you too. Nobody got hurt. Are you kidding? It violates the very idea of a covenant. It's not just a physical act. There's a spiritual transaction. And, and this, as, as good as any that I know, brings it out. And, and he says it in 16. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. That's an act reserved for marriage. But the truth is you become one with that person. And then when they break off, you got Diana Ross saying, set me free, set me free. I'm in bondage over here. Because you are. Part of you is still with them. And it's Humpty Dumpty has to get put back together again. Yeah, it's really, you know, you can understand how the enemy can use this to cause a downward spiral. Once the, once the woman has been violated, now she feels like, why bother trying anymore? I've already lost my innocence. I'm just going to throw, you know, throw it to the wind and enjoy the pleasure part of it. But you're just continually fragmenting yourself as, as, as you do those acts. And, and it, sin has wages. You get a paycheck from sin called death, right? And then he goes on to say, flee sexual immorality. I'm sorry, I'm going to back up for a minute. Sorry. In 16, he quotes, two shall become one flesh. So that's what God said about marriage, but it's, he's also applying this to our relationships with other people outside of marriage. You became one with that person, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. You have the Lord living on the inside of you. So you want to be one with him. If you then join yourself to a harlot or have sex outside of marriage, then he had to be there with you because he's with you. He didn't want to be there with you during that part. You're not going to sense the Holy Spirit in the middle of, of a sinful act of sex, right? That's just, that can't happen. He's holy, and that's not a holy act that we're involved in. I'm sorry if that sounds condemning. I'm really not meaning it to. I'm saying the stakes are really high here. You've got to know the rules of engagement. You, you have to be able to throttle your appetites as a Christian, right? You wouldn't have a gluttonous spirit around food. You'd understand that's not the way it should be. And around sexual desires, the same thing can happen. But fruit of the Holy Spirit in verse 16, I'm sure you all uh, know that one. I'm sorry, 17. No, 23. For Galatians 5.23, the last fruit listed of the Holy Spirit is self-control. So that means, like Trisha said, there's always a way of escape and that we have Holy Spirit inside of us. So then we just say, Lord, if, if, if I'm on my own out there, I'm probably going to fall. But I'm not on my own out there. I need you to help me. Give me that self-control to help me throttle my appetites and I don't want to take too many. I don't want to take any more time. Come on up, and then you know we'll tag team as as we see fit. Amen. That was good. Amen. So let me just read um, two scriptures here, and then we're going to talk about soul ties. Well, first of all, even what he was saying about you know women all get up, caught up as I did about wives submitting to her husband, that doesn't mean you know like we bow to him and kiss his feet or anything like that. That means there's a pref we honor and we prefer one another. We respect each other. And, and, you know, I defer to Peter and things. He defers to things in me, you know, with me. And so we honor and respect each other. But it doesn't mean you lord over. God's not into abuse. Right. Women being mistreated, disrespected. But yeah, there's a verse for that in that same chapter in Ephesians 5 where it says, Husbands love your wives like Christ loves the church. Verse 21 says, submit yourselves one to another out of the fear of the Lord, right? So this is not anti-scripture, what we're saying here. It's not a rebellious woman saying that we submit to one another. That's scripture. And, and the whole model is Christ with the bride, and we're the bride. So it completely ties together. This is a great mystery, Paul says, but it's a reflection of what the Lord wants to do with his church. Anyway, I, I gladly submit to a God-fearing woman. And likewise. And we both honor and respect each other. And, you know, so anyway, so that's important. But when we, we, when we have women come in where they've been abused, sorry, that's where we draw the line. 
God would never want a man or a woman, for that matter, to be abused. So anyway, that's enough said. Let me read this scripture. Listen to this. Proverbs 6, 27 and 30. And then we're going to talk about salt ties one. For, listen to this. For how can a man light his pants on fire and not be burned? Can he walk over hot coals of fire and not blister his feet? What makes you think you can sleep with another man's wife and not get caught? Do you really think you'll get away with it? Don't you know it will ruin your life? You can almost excuse a thief if he steals to feed his own family. How many times have we ministered and, 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 and just have seen the devastations of adultery, of sexual immorality, you know, and, and the wages of sin? I mean, sexual sin is intoxicating, and the enemy blinds that person by that, but it, dis, it brings destruction, like my husband was saying, to a family, to the children, to the extended family. So many people get hurt in this. It's, not, it's just not one person. So um, the other scripture I want to read is um, in uh, Proverbs 7, 21 and 23 in the Passion. It says he was swayed by him. If you read through like Proverbs 4, 5, 6, 7, a lot of that all has to do with sexual sin. And it says here, he, and it says he, but let's say he or she, okay, was swayed by her sophistication, enticed by her longing embrace. She led him down a wayward path right into sin and disgrace. Quickly he went astray with no clue where he was truly headed, taken like a dumb ox. Oh, I guess, see, that's the stupid comes in, alongside the butcher. She was like a venomous snake coiled to strike. So she set her fangs into him, and he's like a man about to be ex executed with a arrow right through his heart, like a bird that flies into a net unaware of what's about to happen. Wow. And who's that snake? The enemy. He needs all of us to respond to him. All right, so it's really, really, really serious. Uh, I'll read one more scripture. Ephesians 4, 18 and 20. And the Passion says the cor their, their corrupted logic had been clouded because their hearts are so far from God. Listen, if your hearts are far from God right now, you can come right back. You can just call right out to him. All right? I don't want to walk around with a cloud around me. And many are. It says their blinded understanding and deep-seated moral darkness keeps them from the true knowledge of God. That's the world. And they, they see it as a religious God, one that has a mouth that's ready to bop him over the head. But that's not who he is. He's a loving, merciful God, but he has orders, right? So he, he, it, it's for our protection. And when we, we disobey, we come out from his umbrella of protection. All right? So it says their, their blinded understanding and deep-seated moral darkness keeps them from the true knowledge of God. God, have mercy on all of us. I don't want to be you know, kept from, from the spirit and the knowledge of God because of spiritual apathy, all right? A passionless church, a lack of a fear of the Lord, passivity. They surrender their lives to lewdness, impurity, and sexual obsession. But this is not the way of life that Christ has unfolded within you. That's not how we're designed. And then um, one last one. Roman, there's so many good ones. It says here, do you not know, Romans 6, 16 in the Amplified, do you not know that when you continually offer yourself to someone to do his will, you are the slaves of the one you obey, either slaves of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness, or right standing with God? You know, there's no slavery worse than lust. Sin is never satisfied. You will never get satisfied. The only way you're satisfied is in him. All right. So anyway, there's I have on your handout, there's a lot more scriptures, but it's I, I see the time. I just want to really share quickly about soul ties. Now, I've shared on this before or touched on it, but I just want to review with them. We're going to do a little illustration here. So soul ties are formed when two or more people become bonded together. Now, my husband said earlier when, let's say, a guy gets together with a prostitute or someone who's been with many people, they're all coming home. All right, and you'll see that because when you become one with that person, you're one with their spirit. And some soul ties are good and others are bad. So now we have healthy soul ties is between a husband and wife. You have a healthy soul tie that's not sexual between parents and children that are healthy, not domineering, not controlling and manipulating. Um, you know, because we're always supposed to honor our parents, etc. We have friendship soul ties, right, that are healthy and, um, you know, 
that like Saul and Jonathan, you know, we all have good friends that we have good, good allegiance with, good ties with, nothing weird, you know, just healthy friendships, right? Then you have your demonic soul ties, all right? And so, um, uh, you know, the demonic soul ties are, is sex outside of marriage, right? And Peter and I both read the scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 16, anything that's contrary to the word, right? And I know of people that one, one person I, I ministered to many years ago, um, the person was enthralled with, uh, I think it was Fleet, Fleetwood Max or one, and, and had an unhealthy soul tie with the singer. We had to cut a soul tie there and cast a demon out of her, and she got set free, right? So music can have that effect, right? You can have a person like a family member who passed away, and it was just that unhealthy soul tie that's there that needs to be severed, right? And, and, and so we'll pray. I'll show you how to pray. It's very easy. Uh, you can have uh, unhealthy soul ties with your church, with any, anyone controlling over you, like where it's lorded in a very unhealthy manner. We have to pray through that, forgive. We, we confess it, we for, you know, repent, we forgive, and we, we break the soul tie, right? And then the sexual soul ties, all right? So they're, they're, when, when um, they're able to enter when spiritual boundaries are violated. God has given us viol uh, got rules that we are to live by and that, that are governed and, and when we violate that, that's when we, we get really messed up, all right? So through a soul tie, there's a spiritual channel that happens, that is formed. And when two are, let's say, in, joining in sex, whatever that person has comes into you. Like, let's, we're talking spiritual impartation. And, and we have ministered one time... Uh, we were ministering at one of these conferences, and we were ministering to a girl, and we were, we were um, severing the soul ties. And this female, when she was talking, she was involved with someone in this particular person's life who was involved with in the occult. He was a warlock. When we went to pray with her to sever that soul tie, the man's voice came out of her mouth. And we're like, okay. And so we had her... I mean, she couldn't talk at first, you know, try to shut her mouth, but we had her renounce that relationship, repent for that relationship, and we, un, uh, you know, un, we cut and severed that soul tie, and, her, you know, there was freedom that came. Now, not every situation is going to happen like that, but there have been some. And, and when we sever these ties, we usually pray deliverance prayer for, like, if there's any impartation from any of these people, because you don't know, right? So repentance is necessary and so um and then also going to a fortune teller if you ever went to a fortune teller you need to renounce that tie because that is something that um you know really can mess with you as well and and we'll do a whole other class on that um all right so what i want to do is i want to uh, just i saw this many years ago um I just want to illustrate what happens with the soul tie, all right? So Mary, Ann, and Eddie, would you please come up? <laughs> so we're going to pretend that Mary, Ann, and Eddie are getting engaged. You're not married. You want it over here? Are you able to? Okay. Oh, you want it up here? So we're going to pretend that they're engaged, all right? So what happens is usually when a couple gets engaged, we want to have some kind of marital counseling. And, you know, I'm going to talk to my husband would talk to Eddie and I would talk to Marianne, Marianne and just see if you had any, you know, we want to repent of any kind of sin. And usually we'll get to a point where we discuss fornication. And so then what happens is Eddie then tells me. Now, of course, you're not in the conversation, Marianne. Well, he would tell you what? Well, come over here. <laughs> <laughs> I submit All right. Eddie would tell you. that he had had uh, sex with women prior to, to marriage, and let's just say it was two women. So can we have two women come up here, please? Just, just come up here. You're only being seen by thousands of people. That's right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, okay, come up here. Now, Eddie, put your arm out. And could you guys hold hands, right? And and you all hold hands, yeah. 
And then we ask, and then we find out that these two girls had relations with other people. So can I get four men, four people to come up, four men or women? <laughs> come on, Nate, let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You all come up here. All right, all right. Yeah, so now we're getting the picture here of what's all involved here. And let me just say this. A lot of times when we've ministered to couples, when they said, I do, all hell is broken loose. And a lot of times it is a result of bitter root judgments and expectancies that's been in their life and soul ties that we need to deal with because we're bringing a lot of this into the relationship. Now, I found that from Marianne. Now, I've ministered her privately, and she told me about some extra, you know, some relationship outside of marriage, so I need some, two women to come up here, or two men, but you're going to pretend you're, you're women, you're men. <laughs> men. <laughs> so you get the picture here of now Marianne and Eddie are, want to get joined together, and we have all these that are coming to the marriage and unless they're dealt with, we have all these involved in their marriage bed. Who gives these people to be married to this woman? <laughs> ah. yeah. and, and so, and that's what has created. How many times have we heard people say, we were great until we got married? Right? Because of the spiritual implications here and the dynamic. And see, the enemy knows this. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that we're not to be ignorant of his devices. And this is what happens. But praise the Lord, we can pray and we repent and we get a cleansing and we sever these ties. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So what, what happens is repentance is necessary. You confess it. And then so typically, you know, what we would pray is we cut and sever an ungodly soul tie. We name them by names of the different people you were involved with. You cut and sever this ungodly soul ties. Be and because typically what we'll pray is we call back the fragments of our soul to make us whole again and we release it back to them. And then, and then if we're in a ministry session, then we take authority if there's over any spirits that could still, that could be there. Not always a spirit there, but if it's there, we take authority or we command it to go. And so that brings tremendous freedom. And it's something that's so important that we understand that, that Jesus Christ died on the, on the cross and he wants us to live a happy, abundant life. But when we have all this that we're starting out with, it, you know, it's, it makes for very difficult in our relationship. So anyway, so um, that's our lesson for tonight. I mean, there's so much we can really ooh, we can uh, share about but we just wanted to give you an overview but we have to understand the word of god is true it's not there to uh, cause uh oh like we can't deny us and we can't have fun that's baloney how many suicides have happened as a result of relationships that didn't work out how many suicides that were or, or people that were devastated and um, or, or just went with multiple partners afterwards or from rape, just the sexual immorality, the sexual sins. And, and you hear of these stories, but then you hear of these marvelous stories of deliverance and freedom that even though it was devastating, but God turned their lives around. See, God never, ever, he sees the end from the beginning. He never wants us to think we're stuck and there's, there's no hope and there's no life and there's nothing going for me. That's a lie. God is saying, listen, I came to set you free, and I came to give you an abundant life, and that you live that abundant life freely and victoriously. We war from that place of victory. He doesn't want us to have a victim mindset or that we'll never, or that we have to be in the sex trade. There are many born-again Christians that are ministering to those in the sex trade. And I, I just saw this book I read a long time ago. I, I, I don't remember what it was called, but it's called... There, it's a ministry angels of something, but they all go into all the strip clubs because this one girl was, she didn't start out to be a stripper, but the money's really good in the industry and wind up getting involved in the ministry. And then, of course, there's so much abuse that takes place. And now 
she got set free because people went in to minister to her, didn't mistreat her, didn't look down on her, didn't call her whore, didn't call her names, ministered to her. And now she has a phenomenal ministry. She, her particular ministry is in Las Vegas and ministers to all the people that are involved in the sex trade. So, you know, again, Jesus wants us to be the light and we have the answer. So I just want to encourage you that if you've never prayed through, and I have it on your handout, uh, and broken off or, you know, re renounced um, soul ties, it's on the, um, I don't know, I think it's on your last page. You need to pray through that or make an appointment and we can pray with you if there's been, you know, you just need to have some help. All right. And then uh, you can take authority over it, but I do recommend that you meet with somebody. And, um, Han, you want to say something? Yeah. We had a, a speaker several years ago, um, Bill Suttis' wife, and she did a teaching on restoring our innocence. And I just want to really encourage anybody that we don't, you know, we don't live in condemnation. Romans eight one, right? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, and and the the blood of Jesus cleanses us of that iniquity, right? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of iniquity. And that includes after you're a Christian, because, you know, guys especially, but it seems like more women lately, pornography is more and more of a temptation, and it's a very defiling thing. But we're not defeated people. Remember, I read from uh, 1 Corinthians 6, such were some of you, but you've been cleansed, right? And I just love the way she talked about how your innocence can be restored in the Lord. And it's not exactly the topic tonight, but I really still encourage everybody I can to watch Joyce Meyer testimony about her own life called One Life, about how she was sexually abused by her father for years while she was in high school. And yet, you know, what the devil meant for evil, God turned around for good because she was able to get the supernatural strength to forgive him, forgive him, but then lead him to the Lord and baptize him and, and uh, be able to even kiss him on the cheek, she said, and not feel reviled by that. Where in the past there was such a, a negative picture painted from all the abuse. So that's supernatural. But God doesn't show favorites, right? So if he did it for her, he can do it for us and does do it for us. And you might know people who just feel like there's no way God could ever forgive me from the thing, for the things that I did. That's a lie. Who's telling her that? The devil, right? And we're here to say, uh, uh, no, sorry, don't, don't ever be, believe that, 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 that things can't change. That person's hopeless. Well, if you say that person's hopeless, you just eliminated God from the formula. And you can't ever eliminate God from, from the formula. Even Lazarus, four days dead, and, and nothing was hopeless there, right? So you know, there's something about coming back out of that tomb that allows you to then help other people because you have an authority. When he sets you free in an area, you then have authority to help people in that area. And there's going to be a lot of people. I mean, I'm sure it's way worse now with this app Tinder. You know, people could just find somebody, don't even need to know their name, and just go through an act that they think is just a physical thing. It's not. It's a very defiling spiritual thing. And, and the good news is the church can help get them free and restore their innocence and have that fresh start. So I just want to say. Yeah, so um, I know it's very difficult, especially if there's been betrayal in your relationship and your marriage. And like, like Joyce Myers, you know, her, it took her a while before she went to her dad. You know, most of us would want to hire someone to take him out. But she, that was God that, that that's only the Lord that she was able to even kiss him on the cheek. Because even when he said, I was like, you know, but, but that was the spirit of the Lord. And I heard Kay, Kay Arthur, and I thought this was good. She said, when Jesus died on the cross, he became that murderer. He became that gay person. He became the lesbian. He became that one that was involved in bestiality. And I never looked at it like that when she said that. And, and so I said, oh, Lord. I said, you became, because he took sin upon him. And I said, Lord, I said, I thank you for your mercy in my life. So mercy, in James it says, mercy triumphs over judgment. So it's like, Lord, help me to have your heart. doesn't mean we roll over and play dead either, but help me have that heart of forgiveness. Like, like it took Joyce Myers a, a while before she was able to do what she did with her dad because, I mean, what he did to her, 
that he just needed to, you know, be put to death or something, you know. But because it was awful. No, <laughs> I know, I know. But it was terrible what, what happened. So, you know, and so that was supernatural for her. So I'm going to just pray because God wants, I just feel like God wants to heal hearts because there's betrayal, there's hurt, there's shame, there's, the, you know, like your regrets. And, um, and so the Lord Jesus wants to heal tonight. And, and so you say, oh, well, we're not going to pray through individual soul ties. No, because I feel like we need to do that a little more one-on-one, -on -one, or you can pray at home, then you know, appointments can be made. But, um, but w let's stand up and let's just pray. Because just remember about his amazing love that he has for us. And, and he doesn't want us walking, like my husband said, there's no condemnation. He doesn't want us walking around in guilt, but he wants us to walk a victorious life and have honor and respect for ourselves and love ourselves and not allow ourselves to be mistreated in any way, shape, or form or mistreat other people, right? So, Lord, we just thank you for your, your mercy. Lord, we are just so grateful for the goodness of the Lord. Lord, your word says, oh, come, let's magnify the Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you have bottled up every tear that has been um, cried out and every hair you've numbered every hair on our heads because you know the pain and the hurt of betrayal and disappointment or being used and abused and and uh, or, or thinking that if you gave yourself away that that man would love you and honor you and he leaves you and there's just so many different scenarios here but Lord in that I ask you to meet each and every one of us right where we're at, that you come and you heal our broken heart. You heal the bitterness. You heal, heal the hardness of our heart for the abuse that was taking place. Only you can do that, Lord. And Holy Spirit, we just thank you that your hand is upon each and every one's life, even those that are in, there's someone watching that, that you're involved in fornication right now. The Lord will provide that way of escape. And so, Lord, I just pray that, that you'll give people the strength and the wisdom to shut the door, that they make that choice to shut the door and make the right choices. Lord, you've called us to be a pure, holy vessel before you. And so, Lord, I ask for the holy fear of the Lord to be released upon your people, upon all of us. But, Lord, I thank you for your tender, loving mercy and compassion to reach out to meet each and every person where they're at. And, Lord, I just loose the blessings of the Lord. I, I bind up all uh, shame and regret and disappointment and, and self-hatred and um, this, uh, you know, all uh, spiritual abuse, Father, we just take authority over that and we lose deliverance. All sexual shame, we bind that up. All lust and perversion, we bind that up in Jesus' name and we lose deliverance. And Lord, I just thank you for a complete turnaround in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just say one other thing. When the maniac of Gadaria, my husband mentioned tombs before. When the maniac of Gadaria he says that he was he hid out in the tombs. But when you look up the word tomb in the New Testament, it means memory recall. And what will keep you in a tomb, what will keep you isolated and bound is when you constantly rehearse your past, when you constantly rehearse the shame of what you've done or if you were involved in sexual sin or you, you've been with many people, man or woman, you know, whatever your lifestyle was. And the Lord doesn't want you to keep rehearsing that. He wants you to repent of it, give it over to him, and then cut it off. He'll bring the healing into your heart. But when that temptation is to rehearse that, don't say no to that because that's the enemy trying to keep you to go over and over. That guy was crazy, the man in Gadaria. And he, he was, he was uh, uh, separated from his family, but Jesus came with that love and compassion and ministered to him, brought healing and restoration and brought him back to his family. So that's what the Lord wants us to do. And so, Lord, I just thank you that even our minds are being healed. Father, we choose not to rehearse the enemy's words in our lives, and we say his voice will be not be louder than yours voice. Father, we will not go there when the enemy of uh, that habit of going back and rehearsing all the wrongs, we say no to that. It's not that we're in denial, but we know it already. We've been through it. But Lord, we choose to focus on what your word says and the promises that you have for us of total freedom and deliverance and restoration. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. 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 Have a good night.